Well, the age of uh, steam has passed. It's pretty much gone the same way as the age of commercial sale. It's very difficult to find a, a real steam-operated vessel today. The uh, only uh, steamboat still operating, authentic steamboat in, in all of New England, is the Sabino, which you see here, which is operated by Mystic Seaport small coal-burning steamer, and she's quite authentic. She was built in 1908 as a, a pedestrian ferry on the coast of Maine. The steam vessels, there are a few steam turbines on the ocean yet, and I think people don't think about it, but nuclear power is steam power. So nuclear vessels are operating, usually with steam turbines. But in general, the steamers have been replaced by large diesel engines. I'm going to be talking about the steamboats on Long Island Sound, and this map shows the basic route uh, taken by the boats. You can see the broken lines leading into Norwalk, Bridgeport, New Haven, the Connecticut River extending all the way up to Hartford, the Thames River with New London at the mouth and the head of navigation in Norwich, and Stonington, the furthest east before you get to the, the border of Rhode Island. And then you have other lines going off the map which go to Narragansett Bay, to Providence, Newport, eventually Fall River, and in, in later years, uh, there were some steamboat services to New Bedford. The Cape Cod Canal wasn't open for large vessels until 1916, and people preferred to avoid the traveling by a vessel around uh, Cape Cod. It was stormy and dangerous, and they were quite happy to take a stu steamboat within Long Island Sound and transfer in the early days to a stagecoach if they were going on to Boston and in later years to train. All those broken lines lead back to Lower Manhattan. This was taken from the Brooklyn Bridge. Brooklyn Bridge opened in, in 1883. And you're looking down on uh, steamboats in the area of Peck Slip on South Street. These were mostly uh, New Haven or Norwich boats that came into Peck Slip. And that's the land side. You have uh, head houses at the piers. You can't actually see the water because you have the sheds there at the inner end of the piers. And uh, the signage advertises not just the primary destination of a steamboat, but other places you could get to, obviously not by the steamboat, by connect, but by connecting transportation. On the lower west side, this was the Fall River Line Pier. The two boats heading up the East River, they're passing the lower end of what's now Roosevelt Island. You can see the, the building that they preserved there. I just make it out right there. It's now a shell, old tuberculosis hospital, but they've decided to retain what's left of it as a picturesque ruin. This shows the two major types. The Bristol is an overnight boat. She's got uh, more than one deck of staterooms the Rosedale is a day boat. Some of these ports, the western Long Island Sound, didn't require an overnight boat. You could get by steamboat to Bridgeport, Norwalk, Stamford, Stratford in a day, so they didn't need boats with a lot of staterooms. A boat like the Rosedale, she actually ran to Bridgeport uh, at times. Also very versatile. They didn't necessarily do that exclusively, 
on the weekends, a boat like that could do excursions, picnic excursions. She could spend time uh, taking people to Coney Island. This is the route, the uh, enclosed route within the East River, the light blue, and the dark blue with the red circle around it is Hell Gate, which was the big challenge for steamboats getting from New York Harbor to Long Island Sound. And eventually in the 1870s and 80s, they would blast a lot of the reefs out of there to make it a safer passage. Robert Fulton invented the steamboat. I'm going, to, I'm going to give him credit for that, though many people experimented with steam-powered vessels. Fulton brought the whole combination together, the practical design, financial support, and political support from Robert Livingston, a very important person in New York State politics. And he used an engine, Bolton and Watt engine, brought over from England. The later boats were engined in this country. This was 1807, and the boat was built to operate between New York and Albany on the Hudson River. Picture of uh, Fulton with his other experiments in uh, semi-submersible vessels to blow up warships. Now Fulton only lived until early 1815. He died, I think, at the age of 50 after a, a short illness. No idea what he might have accomplished if he'd lived longer, but he was very, very eager to uh, expand the use of steam in vessels. He built the world's first steam warship. He built the, the first steam double-ended ferry boats for the Hudson the East Rivers. He improved upon the boats on the Hudson. And he designed and built boats for Long Island Sound. The problem was the War of 1812 was still in progress. And it wasn't safe to operate steamboats on the Sound yet. So it couldn't be good until after his death, the summer of 1815, Ella U.S. Bunker was the representative of his company who initiated steamboat service on Long Island Sound with a boat named the Fulton. Marestier was a French engineer in this country and we're very fortunate. Uh, he was interested in our early steamboats and he did these excellent drawings of the boats which were latest, later published in Paris. And it shows the Fulton of 1815 was a single deck boat, two lounges completely below the main deck. The, the aftermost lounge was restricted to women. A very basic engine there amidships. And you can see even in these lounges, they didn't have staterooms yet. People slept in built-in berths with curtains. People in New Haven, uh, the, the first boat ran from New York to New Haven, Elihu Bunker with Fulton. And shortly after that, in 1816, they added a second boat and they extended the service as far as New London and Norwich. But people in New Haven felt they should be able to operate a steamboat, so they built the United States to run to New York City, and they ran into the Fulton Livingston monopoly. The state of New York had granted a monopoly that was supposed to encourage invention by uh, saying they had the exclusive right now to operate steam-powered vessels in the waters of New York State. So the New Haven people ran into this they were told if the boat came into New York waters, it would be confiscated. So they had to stop at Byron Landing, right at the, the western border of Connecticut, and put their passengers on stagecoach the rest of the way to Manhattan. They weren't happy, and uh, people in Connecticut went to the state legislature 
and actually got a law passed that said if you're operating a boat under the Fulton Livingston monopoly, you can't operate it in the waters of Connecticut. So Elihu Bunker has, can't stop in New Haven anymore. He had to rent his boats all the way the length of Long Island Sound into Narragansett Bay and up to Providence. And they weren't really suited for that long trip. The uh, Sound is considered at its eastern end at the race. The race is the, the narrowing point between Fisher's Island in the north and Orient Point on the south. And it was felt if you were going to run a boat east of that point, you were actually entering part of the Atlantic Ocean, Block Island Sound. But he didn't have any choice. The matter was finally taken up by the Supreme Court, and in 1824, in the decision of Gibbons versus Ogden, the Supreme Court said these state monopolies are unconstitutional. That was the end of that. And it, Overnight, building and operating steamboats was open to anybody who wanted to do it. This is an ad for the United States. And you can see by the date in the lower left, after the Supreme Court decision. Chancellor Livingston was the largest steamboat designed by Fulton and again built after his death. And it first ran on the Hudson River, and then it ran for a time on Long Island Sound. It was even eventually taken to Maine. You can see that the paddle boxes have been added on, but the hull is basically a sailing ship. They were building what they were familiar with. So you see steamboats with figureheads, transom sterns like this. You're beginning to get expansion of the passenger quarters. Now you have a deck house up there on the main deck with more accommodations. In 1833, the steamboat New England was lying off Essex, Connecticut in the Connecticut River, and suddenly it blew up. They didn't understand too much about boiler construction yet. And there was a rash of boiler explosions. And this led to the first federal regulation of merchant shipping, really, as far as ex inspection of vessels. Well, they, they were just inspecting the boilers. And the first licensing, licensing the people who were going to operate the boilers. Well, once it was open to anybody who wanted to get involved, Commodore Vanderbilt decided he would get involved in steamboat operation. He had a couple techniques that worked rather well. Uh, one was uh, rate cutting. He did this in New York Harbor and later on the Hudson River and, and later in Long Island Sound. If he wanted to take over a service, and somebody was already operating a steamboat there, and they were charging $4.50 for passage, he would place a steamboat on that service, leaving at the same time, covering the same route, and he would charge $2.50. If the opposition came down to $2.50, uh, he would drop his rate to $1.50. And they keep that up, and of course, eventually, nobody's making any money. Everybody's losing money, but Vanderbilt's got more money to lose, so he wins out. His second technique was having people buy him off. He would sort of let the word go out that if they paid him enough, he would take his boats and go elsewhere. And he did this in New York Harbor, went to the Hudson River, got into real rate wars on the Hudson, and he was paid very generously by the different companies of competing with him on the Hudson River. He collected the money and he moved his boats to Long Island Sound. And for two decades, he was very active on the Sound. And he continued this trying to uh, 
gather up all the individual lines under his ownership. Lexington is probably his best known boat. Now in the, the middle of the two decade period that uh, Vanderbilt was active, you had the first railroad. George Washington Whistler was a, a pioneering civil engineer building canals and building railroads in this country. He started out on the, working on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. In 1835, he built the first railroad between Boston and Providence, Rhode Island. Two years later, he built the first railroad between Providence and Stonington, Connecticut. Now you saw on, the, on that map that Stonington was right there, the eastern end of Connecticut. It was really the last convenient harbor to go into with a steamboat without venturing out through the race into what was considered the arm of Atlantic Ocean there. And so this was the birth of Stonington as a steamboat port. That's a monument to Whistler in the cemetery in Stonington. And he was the father of the artist, Whistler. Their house is still standing in Stonington. But he was hired by the Tsar to build the first railroad between Moscow and St. Petersburg. And he became ill there as it was being completed and died in Russia. Like the boats, the building what they were familiar with, even in the railroads, they were putting stagecoaches on railway, railway wheels initially. These are the steamboat docks in Stonington. And there was a single line right through the town in the lower left, and then it spread out, went down to the different piers. If you visit Stonington today, you'll find there's a commercial fishing fleet at those piers. And that, that's the remains of that trench, stone line trench, that the single railway line went through, going down to those piers. So now you have the railroads, and the thing you'll notice is there's no shoreline railroad. The function of all these railroads is to connect with steamboats in the different ports. And you had the Industrial Revolution underway in southern New England. And so all these towns up the river valleys are building factories and mills. And the steamboats are acquiring another function. They've been carrying passengers. They've been shortening the trip to Boston. But now they're going to be carrying freight. <coughs> if you're making textiles, cotton textiles, the cotton comes in from the south by sailing ship, and it's landed in New York. And in New York, it's transferred to steamboats. Steamboats bring it to these ports in Connecticut. And there it's transferred to trains going up to all these mill towns. And the finished product makes the reverse trip, comes down to the steamboats, is taken back to Manhattan for distribution. The one railroad you do see here, in addition, is the first Long Island Railroad. It's run down almost the middle of Long Island. They, did, they were not building it to serve communities on the island, really, which were on the north and south shore. They were building it because they had done the arithmetic and they had figured out if somebody takes a ferry over to Atlantic Avenue, Brooklyn, gets on an express train all the way out to Greenport, takes a steamboat across the Sound to Stonington or Norwich, gets on another train to Boston, the trip takes less time than going by an overnight steamboat. Well, apparently not too many bought the, people bought the idea. They were happier spending the night on an overnight steamboat, so this first Long Island Railroad was not a success, and eventually went bankrupt. Uh, Lexington is famous for its fate. It caught fire 
it caught fire because it was carrying cargo of cotton and they, maybe this was too, too new to them, they stowed it too close to hot pipes coming up from the boilers and it caught on fire. This was a bitter winter day and they were off the, the North Shore of Long Island. The captain would have been quite happy to run it ashore and get people off, but the tiller ropes burned through and the boat wasn't manageable anymore. Divers have found the, the wreck and made, some, made the papers with Vanderbilt steamboat headlines, but Vanderbilt had actually sold it before that happened. That's a, a boat in some heavy weather. Samuel Ward Stanton did a lot of drawings of these boats. He was a, an artist historian and editor of uh, shipping journals in New York City. He produced uh, a book in 1893, a time of the Columbian Exposition, of, of his drawings of American steamboats that won a prize at the, the Chicago Fair. This is one example of his work. The Worcester, one of the boats that uh, was briefly used to take people across the east end of the Sound from the Long Island Railroad. New Haven, another boat of that period. Vanderbilt uh, had two boats built, one named for himself, C. Ant Vanderbilt. His rival was George Law, who had a boat called the Oregon. And when, when J James Bard did this painting of the Sea Vanderbilt, he shows the bow of the Oregon just entering the picture in the lower right. <laughs> he obviously was commissioned by Vanderbilt to show that he had the faster boat. Vanderbilt owned several companies, and so that, that's how he got the nickname Commodore Vanderbilt. And so, uh, well, he wanted to have another boat named for him, so he commissioned one named the Commodore. In the late 1840s, this, this boat had a very brief career. Uh, it was uh, the finest steamboat at, at the time, 1847, and it was passing, uh, it was off New London and part of the, the machinery broke, failed, and she was disabled. And there was a storm up, and she was driven on the, <coughs> the east end of Fisher's Island and broke up. Quite a famous steamboat disaster. The bell from the Atlantic was uh, in the collection of the Seamus Church Institute in uh, Manhattan. I'm not sure if it's still there. But right around that time, 1847, <laughs> Vanderbilt was liquidating all his investments in Long Island Sound. He following the, the news, of course, that first we fought a war with Mexico, we acquired California. He began thinking about running ships, steamships, to the isthmus, in this case the isthmus of Nicaragua, carrying people over Nicaragua picking them up with steamboats on the west side and taking them the rest of the way to San Francisco. Of course, the timing was great because now they discovered gold in California. So Vanderbilt just pulled out of Long Island Sound, sold the, his holdings, and uh, individual companies developed. This was a period of stability because each route would have a one company handling it, the Bridgeport line, the New Haven line, the Hartford line, and so on. And a new company was just being formed. If you, you drive through Fall River, Massachusetts, and you see behind the city of Fall River, it's just mills everywhere, all these stone and brick textile mills. And the people of Fall River wanted their own steamboat line to serve that city founded this, the Fall River Line. This was the, the first of their boats, the Bay State, passing the, the old uh, fort there at the Battery, Castle Garden. 
and she was followed by the Empire State, a running mate. We usually had a three steamboat company in these overnight lines because they were alternating each end of the route. A boat on, at the end of the working day, in effect, around five or six o'clock, a boat would leave Manhattan. And around the same time, a boat would leave Fall River, and they would pass halfway. So you needed three, two boats to maintain that service, all their name directions. And then they usually had a boat as a spare, in case one of those was laid up and being repaired. This was the spare boat, which they actually bought in Maine for the Fall River Line. Boats are getting bigger now, that 350 feet. You know, you go back to the Fulton, the first boat is around 100 feet. The Commonwealth is 350 feet long. It was built to operate to Norwich, but the Norwich line had some financial problems, so it ended up with the Stonington line. The design of these boats is becoming pretty bizarre, at least to people who don't immediately understand what's going on here. The British are mystified. And so a British naval architect did these drawings and published them to show people over there what these American steamboats look like. It's a very detailed drawing. Well, for one thing, if you look at European steamboats, they usually have paddle boxes just grafted onto the side of the hull. In this country, we came up with the on the guards system. We have a fendering strip that runs right around the boat. It's protection for the paddle boxes, you can see it here, but it runs all the way from bow to stern. That creates triangular areas of additional deck space forward and aft of the paddle wheels. One thing you can do with that space is put the boilers out there. This boiler is actually sitting outside the hull of the boat. They've got struts to help supporting it. You have the uh, iron rods with turnbuckles coming out for more support. And that's that all this fair paraphernalia that you see above the boat. You also have uh, the hog frames. They're like bridge trusses that extend from bow to stern because these are fairly shallow draft boats and they're still wooden hulls. And they're going to flex too much if you don't add some more longitudinal strength to them. Well, that's the lounge on the, on the Commonwealth, the first Commonwealth. A typical boat of the Norwich line. You can see the boiler out there. This is all begins right here, the overhang that extends all the way to the paddle box and the boiler is sitting out there over the water. Well, they extended the railroad from a railroad from Groton, Connecticut on the Thames River eastward to Stonington. This is actually a train crossing the causeway. If you're familiar with Mystic, the town of Mystic, the railroad bridge is right here. The bridge is still there, the causeway is still there. That's the Mason's Island in the background. So for a time, the, the boats were coming into Groton instead of, of uh, Stonington, but there was a big fire in Groton, the fire that destroyed the pier, the warehouses, everything, and the Steamboat Commonwealth. And at that point, they gave up Groton and they moved the terminal back to Stonington. This is a bigger boat uh, for the Fall River Line. Boats are increasing in size. And this one is uh, unique on Long Island Sound in having four boilers, two on the guards on each side, each one with its own stack. 
Jim Fisk had made some money uh, in his battle with Vanderbilt over the Erie Railroad and decided to go into operating steamboats on Long Island Sound along with his partner Jay Gould. Jim Fisk was a colorful character, Jay Gould was a fairly stoic. So they acquired two giant wooden steamboats, the Bristol and the Providence. These were the largest wooden boats built for Long Island Sound, never exceeded in size. Now you're up to 370 feet. The design on the paddle box is called a Pantheon design. You see this is trompe l'oeil. It's supposed to give the effect of looking into a domed room. Now Fisk operated the boats to Bristol, Rhode Island. There was now a train connection from Bristol to Boston. And of course this was not appreciated by the Fall River Line. So they sat down with Fisk and worked out a deal where the boats would run to Fall River instead. And Jim Fisk would be made president of the Fall River Line. Unfortunately, he was shot in 1872 by uh, one part of a romantic tri triangle, <clears throat> a rival for the for his uh, mistress, Josie Mansfield, shot him on the stairs of a hotel that he owned in Manhattan. This is the upper lounge of the Bristol. You can see there's a, this is called the gallery deck, lined with staterooms, but there's a well here looking down into the, the saloon deck. The Bristol and Providence were built by William H. Webb in New York City. And he was the leading wooden shipbuilder in New York. He built all types of vessels of wood, never of any other material. This included the transatlantic sidewheel steamship China. And when she was broken up around the 1880s in San Francisco Bay, some people salvaged this deck house from the boat and used it as a summer cottage. <clears throat> Years later, a local historical society acquired it and restored it. And it's the, like, the last opportunity to see the actual furnishings from one of these boats of the 1860s. Well, Fisk is supposed to have said, uh, well, if Vanderbilt's a Commodore, I'm an Admiral. And he had a, a uniform made that he felt was appropriate to his, his rank, self-appointed rank. This is a boat of the Stonington Line, Narragansett. The other boat with running mate in opposite directions was the Stonington. And unfortunately, when you have these boats of the same company meeting in the sound during the night, one thing you don't want to have happen is your two boats come together. <clears throat> we realized navigation was primitive. They didn't have radar. If they couldn't see, they just kept going. They navigated by the clock and their ears. They passed an aid to navigation that had a certain bell or foghorn, a beam, and then they said, okay, we're, we're where we want to be. We know how many minutes it'll be to the next one. And so they just kept going. That didn't help out when they heard the fog signal of a, another vessel ahead of them. Didn't tell them what the other vessel was doing. A number of people were lost, but the Narragansett was actually rebuilt, put back in service. These are boats of the Norwich Line. They're naming the boats for the cities that they were serving, the mill towns. These are places the boats couldn't get to, but they had the city of Worcester, they had the city of Lawrence, the city of Lowell. The city of Lawrence in the right foreground was the first iron hall on 
on Long Island Sound. <clears throat> now the next one for the Norwich line was the city of Worcester. She was the real flagship of the company. And you can see, now that they're adopting iron hulls, a lot of that paraphernalia, including those hog frames, are disappearing. <clears throat> These giant paddle boxes were great for coming up with decorative effects. And they had giant paddle boxes because they were using radial paddle wheels. <clears throat> if you look at the paddle wheel here, everything is rigid. This is a more popular paddle wheel design. <clears throat> They call this a lunette, this carving here. Occasionally, museums make this mistake of thinking that it's, when they acquire something like that, that it must have been a stern decoration from a sailing ship, uh, but it's not. That's another bar painting, a beautiful detail they put into them. George Pierce was the leading designer for the Fall River Line. And he was innovative. The first boat he, he designed was the iron hull, but it was fairly standard. It has the, the Pantheon paddle box. But they were getting so much freight business, they were, they were now building freight boats, steamboats just to transport freight back and forth. This one is passing uh, piers in lower Manhattan. And this is one he designed as a freight boat for the Fall River Line. It has a lot of nice detail. The engine controls, the freight deck, the steam steering. But you also see a feathering paddle wheel. They had been used in Europe for a few years. And Pierce decided to use them on all future boats. That's an example of one in a Swiss transportation museum in Lucerne. It was taken from a, a Swiss lake steamer. Now the blades are adjusted as the paddle wheel rotates. These arms adjust the angle of the blades so that they enter the water at the angle of greatest efficiency. Push the water back. If the paddle wheel is more efficient, it doesn't have to be a, as large diameter. So this is the death knell of those decorated paddle boxes. In fact, they're even going to virtually hide the paddle wheels within the superstructure of the boat. This is one of uh, Pierce's masterpieces, the, the Puritan of the Fall River line. And you can see he just put the name here, some fake stateroom windows, and the, disguising the paddle box in effect. The Puritan had the largest beam engine of any steamboat. That's the beam strap. You saw that diamond-shaped beam above the superstructure rocking back and forth. People have uh, come to refer to these as walking beam engines because of the, the rhythm of the beam in motion. It's like a person pace walking. This beam strap is one piece of wrought iron, the largest one ever made. And the interior of the beam was a cast iron frame, web. That's the complete uh, Puritan engine. And if you're not familiar with the beam engine, the reason they were so popular in this country is they're very simple. You've got, uh, this is actually a compound beam engine, but the other cylinder is hidden. But here's the cylinder connecting rod from the piston to one end of the beam, connecting rod from the other end of the beam to the crank throw that turns the paddle wheel. This is the engineer right here. 
the leading builders of these engines, W&A Fletcher Company in Manhattan, originally in Manhattan, this is one of their stock certificates. That was the, the first plant on the west side of Manhattan. 1890, and they moved to Hoboken and created this plant. And they built engines. They never built a hull. All they built were, were steam engines. The hulls were built elsewhere. And they were brought to this shipyard. And everything else was added. The joint, these were all con subcontracted by Fletcher. They subcontracted out the hull, the joiner work, and so on. They built the engines and the boilers. The uh, parts of this building are still there. And that's the last remains of the Fletcher plant in Hoboken, a big machine shop. Uh, fitting out one of these boats in the days of the wooden hulls, this is the shipyard in Noank. Connecticut, which built the largest, aside from the Bristol and Providence, the largest wooden steamboats for Long Island Sound. Now you can see a boat with the superstructure, it hasn't been added yet, shows the, the hawk frame. They built uh, two Rhode Islands in Noank, and their largest boat was the Connecticut. But they were wooden shipbuilders. They even built wooden cargo ships during World War I. In the Connecticut, they made a mistake. They, well, they had built one freight boat with an oscillating engine. And so they thought they could build a, a bigger oscillating engine for the Connecticut. It's a pretty weird engine because the cylinders rock back and forth. As this thing rotates, these cylinders are rocking back and forth. And the steam pipe leading into the cylinders has to be attached like a trunnion on each cylinder. And if they're really prone to break down. The Connecticut was not a great success. Meanwhile, Pierce is continuing to build these boats for, design these boats for the Fall River Line. And there you see the two levels, the, the saloon deck and the gallery deck, both lined with staterooms. Now he starts uh, replacing the beam engine with uh, inclined engines. For one thing, they want to compound. I said the Puritan was a compound. It had a, a high-pressure cylinder and a low-pressure cylinder, but the that wasn't too easy to do with, with a beam engine, but with a horizontal or a inclined engine, you could have almost any number of cylinders in different diameters. And so this is what he's doing. And of course, they had discovered that if you use the same steam more than once, first in high pressure, then in intermediate pressure, and finally in low pressure, each each of these expansions gives you a great saving in the cost of fuel, which is what finally killed off the sailing ships. The triple expansion engine was so efficient in the use of fuel. This was a boat built for the Stonington Line. This was the uh, ferry across the mouth of the Connecticut River. It's actually a railway ferry. That's about the minimum you could have for a railway ferry. There's one railway car. Perhaps there are two on this boat. This is why the coast or shoreline railroad didn't develop that fast. 1870, they built the first railway bridge across the Connecticut at Saybrook. 1889, they finally built the railway bridge across the Thames at New London. So now the New Haven Railroad, if they can buy up all these lines, can put in through rail service from New York to Boston, which is what they did. Behind this was J.P. Morgan, financier. He was a member of the board of the New Haven, New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. 
Morgan was from Hartford. He, oh, everybody else called it the New Haven Railroad. Morgan called it the Hartford Railroad. But Morgan wanted the New Haven to develop a monopoly of all transportation systems. Morgan, of course, believed the only efficient system was monopoly. He wanted them to acquire not just railroads in southern New England, but all the boats and even the trolley systems. In 1907, they bought all these trolley systems, interurban trolleys. Very, very uh, bad year for that because that's the same year that Henry Ford announced he was going to build automobiles that everybody could afford. <laughs> the trolleys were not going to last much longer. Richard Peck was the first propeller boat, 1891, for the New Haven. Well, they did a meeting each other collision. The New Haven still had the C.H. Northam with a wooden hull, and she was run into by the Richard Peck, which almost took her bow off. The C.H. Northam was the only boilers on the guards steamboat to actually survive into the early years of the 20th century. But the New Haven built another boat, more appropriate running mate for the Richard Peck. Pierce is still designing boats for the Fall River Line. Priscilla is considered the queen of Long Island Sound, 1894, the same year that the New Haven Railroad bought the Fall River Line. But she was a pretty magnificent boat. Fall River Line could acquire a monopoly, but that didn't mean nobody could come along and try to compete with them. The Joy Line was one of these, some men who had made a fortune in supplying mining camps out in the west decided they wanted to operate steamboats on Long Island Sound, 1899. They bought secondhand boats and ran them for a while. They even went out to the west coast and they acquired this thing. The Olympian had been built on the east coast, sent out to the west coast. They, they were bringing it back through the Straits of Magellan. But unfortunately, it got away from the tug, went up on the beach. They spent two years trying to refloat it. And this is what's still there. It's one of, uh, <clears throat> there are really three reasonably intact walking beam engines left in the world. The one really intact, you'll see later, is in the Ticonderoga in Shelburne, Vermont. There's this one down on the Straits of Magellan, and the third one is in the ferry boat Eureka in San Francisco, which is part of the museum there. This fellow came along as a real thorn in the side of the New Haven Railroad. He made a fortune in the natural ice industry in Bath, Maine. He was a native of Bath. But he came down to New York and he created a monopoly of the natural ice supply to New York City. And then he was buying steamboat companies, first in Maine and finally coastal steamship companies. And he, now the uh, New Haven Railroad had done a survey of its uh, marine holdings, the boats, the services, the terminals, their repair yard in Newport, and come up with a bottom line figure for what it was all worth. Morse made them an offer. Of course, their figure was confidential. Morse offered them more money than all that was worth, according to their survey. The head of the uh, New Haven Railroad, who had been appointed by J.P. Morgan, that's Charles Mellon on the right, that's his leading lobbyist in Washington on the left. Mellon went to Morgan and said, hey, this guy's offering us more money than it's worth. Why don't we sell to him? Well, perhaps Morgan liked boats too much. <laughs> He's, he told Mellon, no, we're not selling anything to that fellow Morse. So they had to compete. You know, here uh, Morse was bringing out 
turbine steamer, steamships to operate around Cape Cod, New York to Boston, nonstop, and that serious competition for the Fall River Line. So they took a freight boat. They just had two very large freight boats built. Bunker Hill, Massachusetts, old colony. And had them at great expense converted to passenger boats to compete with Morse. These are boats that were seaworthy enough and fast enough to compete with the Morse boats around Cape Cod to Boston. Well, they could have saved themselves the trouble. You would think Morgan and the, and the uh, New Haven Railroad would have been aware of what was going on. But in any case, there was a financial downturn and it was discovered that Morse was up to his ears in bank fraud. He had been getting himself on the boards of these banks, acquiring their assets, turning their assets to buying steamship companies. People had to falsify the books because you know, the banks are supposed to have certain assets. And when uh, the fin financial downturn comes, it turns out they don't have the money. And so he went to prison finally, an 18-year term in the federal prison. His boats that are built to go around Cape Cod were sent out to the West Coast. And in the end, the New Haven Railroad was bailed out by World War I because the, the Navy acquired these three vessel they put all that money into, converted them to mine layers to lay the North Sea Mine Barrage. One of them was still in the Navy, the Agla, under the name Aglala, was actually sunk by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor, rebuilt and used through the rest of World War II as the USS Shamut. Well, meanwhile, Morse is in prison, and uh, his wife went to President Taft and said, my husband is deathly ill, he doesn't want to die in prison. And so Taft actually pardoned him after two years. Morse had a miraculous recovery as soon as he was free. Uh, so the story goes, he and his wife had come up with some mixture of soap and, and other things that would create the appearance of severe kidney disease. Morse went back to operating overnight boats on the Hudson River. One of them was called the C.W. Morse. Meanwhile, the, the New Haven Railroad had acquired the Joy Line quietly. They now owned it, eliminated that competition. But shortly after they acquired it, they had its worst disaster. The large amount was run into by a schooner off Block Island on a, on a bitter winter day. They don't know if the passenger list went missing, so they don't know uh, how many people were lost. It was around 150 people. This uh, postcard publisher didn't waste any time. February 11th to February 25th also did a postcard of a deck house that washed up on the beach in Rhode Island. Meanwhile, the New Haven Railroad is still operating the Fall River Line, and they finally came out with the, the largest boat of the company, the Commonwealth No. 2, in 1908. The, uh, New Haven may have breathed a sigh of relief with the demise of Morse and the, and the Joy Line, but it was brief. One of the Joy Line people returned, Frank Dunbau, started up another company on Long Island Sound, budget company undercutting the New Haven, bought secondhand boats, uh, some of them from uh, Chesapeake Bay, and created the Colonial Line World War I, uh, some strange things happened. This was the second Rhode Island built in Noank as a wooden 
side wheel steamboat. And you look at this picture, you wonder what on earth were they thinking? And they took all, all that support that the boat had as a steamboat, re-rigged it as a six-masted schooner. And they, they loaded it up with coal, and before it got to sea, it sank off Staten Island. They raised it, they mined the coal out of it, they filled it with lumber, sent it out a second time, and it sank off Cape Hatteras. In the 1920s, by now, uh, Cape Cod Canal is open in 1916, so you can run boats from New York to Boston. So Eastern Steamship built the New York and the Boston. The Jazz Age now, uh, you have to have a bandstand and a dance floor. This is the early 1930s. The, the uh, New Hampshire built for the Stonington Line, the Providence built for the Fall River Line. Uh, one of the primarily freight boats of the Starin Line, which ran to New Haven. That's the uh, phone company building on the west side, just north of the World Trade Center site, which is, that building is still there. The Priscilla, on well, one of her last trips through Hellgate, well, had to have been taken from probably the Hellgate Railway Bridge. 1937, there was a, a seaman strike. There was a rash of them, actually. But there was a sit-down strike on the New Haven steamboats. And the New Haven Railroad, of course, J.P. Morgan had been long dead. The New Haven Railroad said, that's it. They, they, wound up the operations. They sold the boats immediately for scrap. They were broken up in a scrap yard in Baltimore. And some pieces, like this stern from the Priscilla, were rescued by the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. There are other artifacts from the Fall River Line in the Marine Museum at Fall River. Meanwhile, uh, Dunbow is still operating the Colonial Line right up to the outbreak, or right up to our entry into World War II. He's still doing this with second-hand boats. This was a boat built for the coast of Maine. He bought two boats called the Belfast and the Camden and renamed them Arrow and Comet. I guess suggest speed, which they didn't have. And then his last boat was a Meteor. That's the old Chester W. Chapin, which was built for the New Haven for the New Haven line. She ran right into the, the month that we entered World War II. And then the government said they wanted all these boats. They wanted some of them for transport, some of them for floating barracks. They used the Richard Peck in Bermuda to house workers building U.S. bases there. Well, here's Ticonderoga, just for a look at one of these intact steamboat, side wheel steamboats, a day boat in, a, in effect, not an overnight. It's the beam, the feathering paddle wheels, and uh, you can see by the diameter of that wheel that some of these windows up here are just fake. Purse's window, when you came on board these boats and you entered on, at the wharf level, uh, you picked up the keys to your stateroom, up the, the grand stair, on the, not quite as grand as Priscilla, but, and she is beautifully maintained, and all parts of this boat are accessible to the public. You can go down in the bilges, you can, down in the boiler, well, I think I may have here, it's a dining room, a nice place to watch the passing scenery while you dine. A few staterooms. The day boats would have a few if somebody really wanted privacy, they could pay extra. This is the engine controls. Uh, Fletcher engine 193, fully intact. The gauge on the, the bulkhead tells you the position of the crank. In a single cylinder engine, if you stop the engine on dead center, you're stuck. You have to get it 
in some of these boats, they'd have a long wooden beam. They'd open up a door to the, the paddle box, and stick this beam in the paddle wheel, and get it off dead center. When the boat was maneuvering, getting underway or arriving, the engineer <coughs> took control and operated the valves, valve the steam by hand. And that's what all these things are to uh, regulate the inflow and outflow of <coughs> steam from the cylinder. That's the crank throw and the massive forging, this thing here, the connecting rod coming down and rotating that thing. You can see how it gives you the force to <coughs> turn the paddle wheel, the boilers. The wheelhouse, she has, uh, this would be steam steering, and this is uh, cables. Wheels big enough to go right down through the floor, the deck, and cables all the way to the stern to operate the rudder. And that does seem to be the last.